Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. The final part of the Academy and Outreach Series, Preparing for the Match. I'm Bill Ray, eContent Manager at the Academy, and I have just a few house moderators for tonight's program. We strongly encourage you to use the webinar to communicate with fellow attendees and direct questions to the presenters will ask during Q&A. You'll receive an email tomorrow asking for feedback on the program. It's a quick five-question evaluation and activity in the future. For tonight, tonight, Dr. Shahzad Mian and Susan Foster. Dr. Mian is a professor in ophthalmology and visual sciences at University of Michigan Kellogg Eye Center and holds the Terry J. Bergstrom for resident education. Dr. Mian is also the current president of the Program Directors Council sorry, of the Association of University Professors of Ophthalmology. Dr. Forster is a clinical professor and director of medical studies at Yale School of Medicine, Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Science, and Chief, ophthalmology, Chief of Ophthalmology at Yale Health. Dr. Forster is also the immediate past president of the Association of University Professors of Ophthalmology's Medical School Educators. Welcome to you both. Thank you, Mike. So it's just great to have all of you here, and I hope we give you a wonderful evening where you learn lots and we all have fun sort of discussing this all together. Our first speaker, as you know, we're trying to the you know pearls that are going to help you with the match. Start with the perspective from the department. Stephen McLeod, the M, and Wayne M. Cagill. Uh, distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at the University of California in San Francisco. So he's here's perspective. Great. So first I'll make sure. Am I unmuted? Can everyone hear me? Um, I'm seeing. Uh, I think great. we can hear you. Yes. Fantastic. Thanks a lot for joining. And uh, I'll try to get started with this from the chair's perspective. And I'll, I'll start out by saying, of course, that you know it's actually the residency program director's perspective. Mike will agree, uh, but I'm happy to share with you uh, what our contribution is to, to the um, to the thought process when when we start thinking about uh, resident applicants. So the, it does raise the first question, which is whether or not the uh, the chair and the program directors will, will actually be looking for different things. You know, there um, whether it's uh, you know apples and oranges, and uh, when you actually try to get past anecdote and actually uh, get real information about really are looking for. It turns out that most of the literature actually is uh, based on surveys of program directors. Um, but of course, practically speaking, there's going to be a fair amount of overlap. And I'll try to point out where there's convergence and where there are a few things that uh, might be distinctive that one might want to, to bear in mind. You know, I think that um, if you look at the literature, uh, it sort of starts off with a lot of it converges around what that came from this uh, uh, came out in uh, in 2000 and in, in 2000 and 2006. They had about 2,000 residency program directors, and they had um, that they, that was surveyed. About half of them actually responded, and uh, what it did was was come up with uh, those criteria that seem to drive uh, decision making, and, and we can go over a little bit over it. But I think what it, when you look at that list, what, lots of things that are numerical uh, metrics, things we can but it's interesting if you if you actually sit down and talk to whether it's to to faculty to or to you bring in, you know the first thing that people are going to talk about are quality of character issues, empathy and honesty, and it's one of those things where you know no no impressive some. Uh, it's a, just a non-starter that, that the, the honesty, the ethics, the empathy, the, the physician qualities of those individuals um, are at all in. Those are not the things we, we value them. Uh, they don't actually um, show up distinguishing features identified when, when one starts looking at that. At, um, uh, at end up um, gravitating towards uh, other things we can measure. You know, the USMLE, 
one is AOA, the, the published, um, the, the uh, publications and, and, and clerkships. So just taking you quickly through, um, through the framework that I think this particular study um, provides for us, which really is very metrics driven, I'll, I'll try to give you some sense of we are going to be looking at those things, what seems to come to mind. I think that the general consensus and this, remember, this particular study was looking at, at, um, at uh, a wide range of specialties. covered 21 subspecialties, but I think there's some, some practical things for ophthalmology in here as well. And, and no matter what specialty you're in, um, that clinical performance does make a big difference because it sort of gives you a general sense of what the physician that, uh, that of, of, uh, of clinical accuracy to work with other people, um, with uh, your approach to patients, and so on. So the required um, clerkships and the honors grades is somewhat uh, helpful, and, and it really is consistently at, at the top. Uh, you know, for us, um, you, and particularly with the timing of when the USMLE um, data come out, the step one score is, is available for everyone. Well, honestly, and if you've got a few hundred applications, it's an easy thing to identify. It may take on a little bit more um, uh, uh, weight than it ought, uh, but it is an easily accessible number, and you know, human nature is we do tend to gravitate towards it. You know, in this particular grades are pretty high. It's in ophthalmology. You know, I think that um, as a subspecialty, it's pretty uncommon for someone to do badly in their ophthalmology specialty, and so that doesn't really for a great deal. And as I pointed out, set step two. Available uh, for 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 ophthalmology, I would I, I think that you know the the class rank and the AOA is always going to be helpful, and, and I think for for us it's probably going to um, uh, take precedence. Of One of the things that's probably you know honestly, I think that practically speaking, um, uh, 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 only goes so so far. So I think that it, the, the, the playing field may be, uh, I think, reasonably fair in that, uh, you know, in general, good performance is seen as good performance, uh, no matter where it is. And, uh, and, and, and this, of course, may vary from institution to institution. You know, I, I personally do not feel ab abstract sometimes um, difficult to justify um, of medical schools necessarily impact on outcome. Uh, you know, so um, there's this utilitarian about that. Now, um, research one, and I actually think that by uh, 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 what the is that the particular program is looking for, and there are some programs that and others that don't. Um, some people will see um, you know, research as a sort of recovery mechanism for, for um, things that may be uh, challenging otherwise. They um, wouldn't say every school medical necessarily um, a, uh, a driving issue. You know, I think that one of the questions you might have is where do the chair and the program director differ? And I think that the difference really is that thinking probably more about the legacy of the program in the long term, whereas the PD has to manage people on a daily basis and make sure they get along and do a good job. So I think the trade-offs that a PD may look for in terms of destiny for greatness um, versus uh, you know daily performance, it may be a little bit uh, different. And I think the point is there's a home for everyone with our residency program director really likes the analogy of height versus hustle, you know, that sort of emerges from our world of basketball. I think that, you know, people can, you know, can, will easily um, identify the tall guy, uh, Golden State Warriors, and, uh, and the little guy. And, and just remember, you know, I think it's pretty um, one of those things in the lore. You know, I, Isaiah Thomas actually went last as a pick in the, in the 2011 NBA draft. Uh, you know, not, not last in the first round, last, literally the last taken. And this is a guy that, you know, um, uh, you know had an amazing um, uh, rookie season and, and you know, um, basically uh, took on, you know, rookie of the month, 11.5 uh, points, uh, you know, a, a game in the first season. And, uh, you know, he's tiny. 
Uh, so you know, there's 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 so much that you can get from the hustle, and uh, and I think a lot of um, programs really appreciate that. And so, um, with that, uh, you know, we we feel that that we can make a we can make a home for for someone who's really who really has the energy to to put all they can into into the game. All right. I think that is it with 15 seconds to go. Michael's timing me. Thank you, Stephen, and. If everyone would enjoy, uh, just go ahead and type in any questions that you might have, because we have a few minutes before we'll move on to the next speaker. Um, so there's a question here that is, when talking about the importance of clerkship grades, number one on the list, do you mean summative uh, report from our attendings or the actual honors, high pass, pass, fail grade? Yes. Interesting because you know different medical schools treat this um, very differently, and we've sort of by now figured out um, which are the schools that just tend to give everyone something they call honors in just about everything. Which um, schools do tend to curve people a bit, and which schools you dive into the comments to, to get anything useful. To a great extent, it actually depends on the school, but the idea is that people are actually. Paying you know, people will actually pay attention um, to to the best information about the required clerkships to actually who by that school is a good medical student. Uh, we have another. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead, Sean. I was just going to say there's just another question to asking about research uh, in terms of specialty specific versus other specialties. Is it Doing any research is okay. It is and more important to do ophthalmology research. Um, I, I I do not add that 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 doing specific research in in, in ophthalmology should convey any advantage whatsoever. Basically, um, what should come out of of uh, what should emerge from from that research from that research experience is does that person actually to what extent does does that person actually care about of their career as opposed to you know checking a box and and uh, and and what's the quality of the work what's the quality of the output and you know where it, it's you, you really and not just uh, you know I'm I'm just doing more of it that's very specific to ophthalmology there's another question about um, grades again this is talking about uh, the question is really specifically about your clerkship grades that part of the score is uh, shelf exam score is obviously the evaluation. Do you think that uh, it matters how you do overall, specifically if you do well in the shelf exam? Yeah, I think that it's really the overall um, performance that, that we're looking at. I mean, there are, there are other ways, that, because the USMLEs are going to start how good a person is it taking. So it's really sort of what is the composite evaluation of the individual that ultimately. I guess we can do our lap. The, there's one more up on step one score. So this is asking about what is the step one score that you like to see in an application? Um, you know, I think that different places have different cutoffs, um, you know, uh, and some people don't use a cutoff at all. I mean, you know, for us, we get 300 applications, we interview 30. We're going to have a very different um, cutoff than than, in the, than other places, and and in many cases, again, it's it's not a it's not a fixed number. Um, it's just the to accept that um, that there is um, particular attention that needs to, um, to, to be paid if, if, if it's acknowledged that the board score is a bit of a disadvantage. Sorry, I was going to, I think, review specific. Uh, we can see from the match students, so that this will come up again. And the other question, I think, what does a student do they just bomb on the step, step one. What would you suggest that they do a portfolio that looks attractive to a, a program? Well, I think in that case, you know, that different, and, and, you know, I know that the timing move is a little bit of a, but I think that, that those, there are some individuals 
out of their way to make sure they have the step twos available um, if, if that's if that's an issue because obviously the, the focus is, is different um, but it but it does you know at least I think help a bit great um, there are Another question here that is asking about how much weight is placed on the undergraduate grades. Interesting. You know, it's one of those things that, that is, is, you know, sort of a, a point of interest, but, uh, I, you know, we, for us, we get more out of the medical school grades. It's, it's sort of a thing of interest, but it's not really, it's certainly not one of the things that's going to drive a thumbs up or thumbs down if you got a if or a borderline, um, should we interview or not? It's it's absolutely going to be something that's that's more relevant to current to current performance. Great, thank you. Let's go on, and then we will take up the other questions that have come up. But why don't we go on to our next speaker? So next up, we have Dr. Michael Sikowski. Uh, he will be speaking about preparing for the match. What does the program director look for? David Park. He's the David Ross Boyd Professor and the Residency Program Director, Vice Chair for Academic Affairs at Dean McGee Eye Institute. He's also going to be the President of the AUPO President, um, Program Directors Council in a, about a week. Mike, are you up? Yes. Th thank you very much. I take it you can all hear me okay. Uh, I would just like to start out by saying that, you know, from Oklahoma City, uh, we actually don't interview anybody who's a Golden State Warriors fan at all after the Durant fiasco. But other than that, we're open to all applications. So will you go to the next slide, please? This is the same slide that Dr. McLeod just showed you, so I'm not going to beat this again. But I think that this is important from a fairly large powered study to know what people are looking for. And I don't think it changed a lot in the last decade or so that you see is that most of these things are very measurable. So next slide, please. So things that are easily measurable or easily quantified are great things for us to look at in order to sort of rank and categorize. We've talked about and as Dr. McLeod said, that's it's uh, endpoint, you know, should you interview above or below this, just because it's measurable and it's standardized and everybody takes it. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what scores are, are that, that we look at. Everyone's got a different cutoff, and we have a range of cutoff depending on what the rest of the application data looking at the match program over the past several years, that if your score is above 240 or 245, you have an extremely high, you know, well over 90%. So if you're in that range, you should feel very comfortable. Low 225 or 220, then your odds go significantly down. You may want to think about uh, you know, possibilities if you don't match. You really want to expand the best chance. It, the people in between there still have of matching, but add a lot more weight that we'll talk about. So people ask about step two. My advice to most people is. Don't worry about step two uh, because if most people from step one to step two. So if you take step two and you do this well, maybe in some programs it might hurt you. So I usually advise people not to worry about it unless you have a very non-competitive step one score, then I think it, it could potentially help. Class rank, GPA, obviously, as Steve discussed, those are easily quantifiable, uh, important things. Uh, we're, we recognize that different medical schools rank things differently. Some rank by quartile or quintile or tertile, and that and, and compare them overall. That's why sometimes the GPA is helpful. How many A's or honors are in your rotation? We're looking generally at what's the overall score shelf score plus uh, qualitative score, and how did you rank compared to your peers? Membership in AOA, yes or no? And I think over the past five years or so, the gold unit is a monitor 
more important uh, 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 and is really helpful if you're uh, positive in that regard. We also look for people with other advanced degrees uh, to see what additional characteristics and broadening that they may bring to a residency. And we also realize that generally people with other actually have scores uh, than others for a variety of things like timing and um, you know other things they've been doing along the way so we take that into consideration as well next slide so then there are things that are sort of measurable and research is uh, one in this category obviously you can say yes or no we've done research that's measurable but there's sort of a hierarchy of research we think about the gold standard is a publication in a uh, peer-reviewed journal, that's great if you get that. Uh, everyone doesn't get that. Presentations at national meetings, whether it's an oral presentation or a post. Other I gave a grand rounds. I've started work on this, or I will be starting to work on this, uh, merit the same level of presentations and presentations. It's not just have you done it, how much have you done? And I agree with we're looking for commitment and follow through and organization as a surrogate for other members on the team. We think that's an important uh, thing that you get out of research. Recommendation letters, important. You know, we have all your grades, all your numbers. We want to know what you like as a person, how you get along with others. So we want to know about your character. Professionalism and communication skills. Um, decade or this is the best student I've seen all year. You know, those are really important comments, uh, as are uh, some of the summaries that we get in the to highlight uh, all the positives. And uh, if there are some important pertinent negatives that they want us to know, they'll tend to put that there. Next slide. And other things we can't measure, but we think they're just as important. We look at how history. Have you ever had a job? Uh, people who have never had a job may not have the same level of experience and personal uh, interaction skills that you need in a residency. Uh, what else have you done? Can you, uh, are you, you've done team-based things. Have you found something in the arts or athletics or something that you've enjoyed and excelled at? Uh, how do you serve your fellow man and uh, woman in the community? What do you and so? What What do you like as a holistic person? That's really important to us. Have you had leadership experience, both both in your medical school as well as outside of medical school in a community organization or the boys or girls club or teaching a kid to read or in your synagogue or whatever that might be? And we do read the personal state. Uh, when you have 500 that you want to take a look at, you really want something that stands out. And there are certain things that uh, everybody says, the eyes are the window of the soul. You know, I like to see old people and young people and do medicine and surgery. You know, those they're so boilerplate. Um, we know why you want to do ophthalmology. We get it. We want to know about you in this personal statement. Tell us what makes you tick, uh, why you think you'd be a good fit for us. Give us a personal statement that makes us want to meet. Next. Uh, and then we get to the interview. And once you get to the interview, you're on equal footing with everybody else. Make sure you get along with the other people you're interviewing with, the residents, the program coordinator. We look to see how you act socially at interview things. Are you dressed appropriately, professionally? Do you speak in a professional mind and professional manner? Get good at body contact, or rather, excuse me, no, at eye contact. Watch your body language. We have lots of candidates who struggle with anxiety or who are not experienced or comfortable in some high stakes or high stress situations. There are lots of courses and programs out there that can help. And if you're in that category, I strongly do it. Uh, next slide. McLeod said, character is extraordinarily important. I think of it, what you do when nobody else we don't want you to be arrogant, but we want confident people. We want to be confident that you can behave ethically in stressful or unusual situations. Tell us who you really are. Don't over or understate on your personal statement. If you say you're fluent in Spanish, 
someone's going to probably try to talk Spanish with you. So be honest and work in a team, and we'll go to the melting pot in our residency. I want people who are going to go and and contribute in different ways to the profession and society, but everybody's got to be able to think well, work hard, and work well together. Especially thanks. Mike is out there in Oklahoma. Uh, he is sort of winging this in the dark, and so thank you very much. Let's go, uh, if your game will just What, get some of some ideas from you on what you're thinking. So we have a question here that's asked on letters of recommendation. Do you normally have one from internal medicine and two, or can you have some other in the people who you're going to ask to give recommendation? The recommendation is at least two are acceptable, but not three. Uh, somebody who knows you well and can really testify to your work care with your medicine, pediatrics, surgery, psychiatry, whatever. And uh, my the person think that knows you the best and will write the best letter. So a letter from the chair of the department says uh, this was a nice two days in clinic is not as good as a letter from an, an assistant professor that says, this is the best student I've had in out of training. So it's that sort of combination that you want. Thank you. Can you add to that by speaking about getting letters from your uh, research advisors, for example, D? Yeah, I think that's extraordinarily helpful. In fact, for somebody who has an MD, PhD, we would expect a letter from their research advisor. And I would say that we, and I think a number of other programs, will accept letters in the match, but we will accept additional letters sent to us, you know, by regular snail mail. And I think, you know, for some candidates who have extra degrees or experiences, I think that might be very helpful. There's also a question here asked not to worry about step two. What do you mean? Well, I mean, my standard advice is don't to take it after the match is over. And the reason I say that is because uh, the only situation I think it's really helpful to you really low step one, two score is notably higher confidence that, you know, the step one might have been a fluke or, you're, um, or something else that happened. So if you don't, it doesn't help you at all. And some people may, and if you go up a bit, that's just kind of par for the course. So there are, uh, it takes a lot of time when you're doing other things like, you know, your application and preparing to interview and maybe finishing research. And I think that in most cases, the time is better spent focusing on those things and doing the steps. But I should note that you do want to take it, uh, you know, after the, the winter break because uh, some programs want to be sure, you know, you've got your step two matriculate you into a I think most schools actually have that as a requirement that you can't graduate from medical school without step two because most states require you to have PG2 to um, get credentialed for internship. Yeah, I think that's to take it. Um, you, you may take it like in May or at the medical school for back in time for licensing and things. So don't wait that long. But you can certainly take it after the uh, ophthalmology yep. match. Yes, I think so. Where your where you go to school or regional preferences? Do you think that there's a preference for home uh, to match in residency, or are there regional biases in terms of matching? Do some programs only take people from a certain region, or are they open from everywhere? Well, you know. I can't speak for every program, but I, my my places are open to everywhere. I mean, uh, sure, everyone likes someone from their home school. 
from the region, but really at the end what you want is the best candidate for your program and the best fit. And we have had years where half of our residents were from the University of Oklahoma, and we've had a couple years running where none of our residents were. So it really depends on the person more than the geography. Um, so it, um, I can add. So um, our program director, Eamon Nasri, actually looked got, looked at over the um, the data um, with with um, some attention to part of this question. And particularly, um, if you just look at probability of match that to geography, there is no that um, that the the probability of matching within the home state is way higher than matching outside of the whole state, which sort of which sort of makes sense because obviously that's going to be influenced by to some extent by people who own a program. Um, but uh, um, it, it, in many cases, you know, you have to make a choice if, if you have too many interviews and you have to decide, you know, which ones you're going to go to, which ones you're not going to go to. Um, and it's, I'm not quite sure what drives it. It may well be it's something like, you know, um, people always want to make sure that if they offer an interview, people actually will come. If they offer a spot, then they're not, you know, reasonably high likelihood of going there and, and so you know an expression of, of, of a commitment to a geography may help with that it's not it's actually not clear what it is but certainly um, th there is no one people do tend to, to match at higher rates within their geography I think part of that is some self-selection too many people choose a medical school where they have friends or family or ties uh, so it, it goes both on both sides temp time wise absolutely There's a question here asking, with the ACGME merger, will program directors give more notice to DO applicants? Uh, I, uh, DO candidates apply already. We review those programs with the same standards uh, that we review everyone else. And we, in fact, we have a DO joining us uh, this as part of our residency. So I think, uh, 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 again, we're going to look at the, the candidate and his or her performance. Uh, and just for clarification, that the ophthalmology residencies are going to be under ACHME. Nothing is schools are, uh, uh, you know, the, the education or training you get at your that part is still going to be the same. It really, the change that the residents. And maybe the last question before the next speaker will be um, on how MBA degrees are perceived. Uh, the additional graduate degree is, is seen as a plus uh, because it, it brings a different level of experience and you know these are people that can add something new to a program in many cases it's not as important as the other factors we talk about but it, it is an additional positive characteristic in, in let's go on to our third speaker who is Sandra Montezuma who is an assistant professor University of Minnesota in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visual Neuroscience, and she is also the medical student course director there. Uh, so let's go ahead and have Sandra give us her thoughts as the medical student educator. Thank you, Susie, for the introduction. So now that we know what the chair and the program director are looking for, uh, my talk is about how can we get you there? So I'm going to provide you with six tips to match in ophthalmology. So first, you need to know that the ophthalmology matching program and other residency specialties. Ophthalmology uses the San Francisco and the Central Application Service for their application um, and the matching. And other specialties uses the ERAS or electronic service, and the NRMP, the National Residency Match Program. You need to know about because even though technology, you need to do your PGY-1 or PGY-1, 
Center 1, and so you need to apply through Good mentor. Why? Because you're a strong candidate. You need someone who advocates for you, a mentor in their career, from med school, residency, fellowship. Your first years of academic practice, you need a mentor. What mentor can you choose? So you can ask homology program, medical student or the ophthalmology. Some uh, uh, ophthalmology departments have an associate program director or even just a faculty member that has a good publication record and a good record of helping medical students in matching could be a good mentor for you. Tip number two is prepare patient early. So you need to know that the San Francisco match and the National Residency Application Service have different San Francisco matches earlier than is about a month earlier. And the ideally process by August 15 is a target for the CAS application. So this is probably the, the time to start. In early April, you have to start working on your CV, working and asking who are you going to, uh, who's going to provide you letters of recommendation, start looking for the programs that you want to apply. Um, recommendation. Um, overall, is is uh, you have to ask somebody who actually knows you well, who advocates for you. And uh, the best piece of advice is to ask early. Remember, your letter writers are busy people, so you have to give them at least four weeks, and ideally like two months of notice in order to recommendation. We we recommend. Uh, two letters from ophthalmologists and um, one from a, a faculty member or, a, or, a, or um, on, the, on the core clerkship like medicine, surgery, or pediatrics, but overall, again, somebody who knows you really well. Treatment, um, as uh, it was discussed before by Mike, um, you know, we receive tons of applications, over a hundred of applications, so make it short. Less than one page for your uh, personal statement and start early. Revise, revise, and revise that uh, personal statement. Um, ask a friend, ask your mentor. Personal statement is something that has to stand from the other applicants. Um, remember, you are in charge of upload uh, to the CAS systems your undergrad, undergraduate transcripts. The med school would upload your medical school transcripts. And you also are in charge to upload your USMLE scores to the CAS system. Know if you are a strong applicant. It's basically what we all heard. And uh, what statistics, the San Francisco match statistics. So if uh, the, uh, the graph here, it doesn't provide me. I don't know if you can see this graph. I cannot see it. Um, so uh, if this year, mean um, uh, USMLE score was of 200 January of 2009, where it was 235. So that score is going higher and higher. The average is going higher from 2009. There were 50 applications per applicant. And this year, by January, the people who match got applications per applicant. Um, the medical school grades are very so get as much or not alpha omega alpha is ideal but it's not mandatory because we know if you got the AOA status is because you receive honors in most courses and you are high up in your class rank um, as we uh, said before publication research grant major accomplishments um, a PhD, or you, have, or even not really a scout, or in a sports that you stand out on marathons, anything that you can put in your application is good. And overall, I would say that people who match into ophthalmology got 12 interviews. And more important interviews is actually uh, your credentials. 
is more important than this number. Tip number four, make yourself a better candidate. So we heard all, academic, uh, all, the, all the academic achievements about AOA, rank class, number of honors, USMLE, awards, publications, grants, etc. So work on those early on. Uh, very important, I, I recommend uh, that you go to major meetings like the American Academy of Ophthalmology or ARVO. Ideally, if you can present a poster or do a podium presentation would be ideal. But uh, it, it, it's not a way to communicate to others and to know other, um, other programs. You can search also for research opportunities at the AO in case that, for instance, you feel that you're not a good candidate a year of research, so the flex year, um, the, perhaps at a, at a major meeting, you can start looking for those research opportunities. And I also have many medical students that have attended to the AAO, and afterwards they got interviews from the programs that they have spoken at that meetings. Um, uh, during summer, also look for uh, research projects, and it doesn't necessarily need to be on ophthalmology, but any other research that you have done during your career, it makes yourself a better candidate. Foreign graduates, um, I myself am a, a foreign graduate, so I would say for matching in ophthalmology is you actually did and where your mentor is willing to advocate for you. At least one year in the United States before applying for residency. Um, other community and volunteers like Lions Club, ophthalmology interest groups, all those things are important in your application. Advanced ophthalmology rotations are provided by some uh, ophthalmology departments. Rotation is a, good way, is a good way to know the program your your rotation, whether it's like the program, and it also is a if you really work hard in that program, it's likely that you're going to get an interview at that program. Uh, my tip is uh, prepare for the interview, and the key here is practice, practice, and practice. Uh, do mock interviews that can be offered by uh, the medical school, so ask a uh, you can ask also your mentor to, to provide, or she would be willing to provide an interview. The day of the interview, we discussed that it is good to wear a business professional attire. Um, I also recommend and advice to, ser to research about the program. So you can go to the, to the program. And the program, so the day of the meaningful conversation uh, with the program director, for instance. Sometimes if you don't get a good what questions to ask, um, attend to social media, it's a good way to know uh, the program. So um, it's a good relations with the residents and ask about the program. Um, How you behave, even if, if, if everybody is watching you and everybody is looking for any, might not be a good fit for their program. Another piece of advice is that it's easy to say, but relax and be yourself. You know, but if you are very well prepared, that's the best way to stay relaxed, relax and uh, yourself. Um, one piece of advice is that in the application you should include about yourself, uh, any hobbies that you like, things that you like, ophthalmology, because this is going to lead to a major point of talking during the interview. And that's a, re a good way to help you to keep relaxed. Uh, remember, everybody is watching you, so be very polite to the administrative assistants and, and the staff. And um, my last advice is to yourself. There are uh, several uh, educational materials about the matching guide. This is right here that we wrote here at the University of Minnesota. But there are uh, multiple other options in the American Academy. You can get more advice. So uh, read about it. And uh, at this point, I'm going to start
start taking any questions. Thank you. That was uh, great. There's a question here about someone whose husband is also a medical student and wants to match in emergency medicine. And because the, they're different matches and they're unable to partner in the match, would you suggest that the, it would be appropriate for them to bring up that they're trying to match at the same uh, program or same uh, hospital? I would advise yes, you can bring that up. A, um, say about it and what uh, Stephen has to say about it. Overall, I have seen the situation, and you know, if if candidate and the program really likes you, then they they probably will help and, and communicate to. So, Mike and Stephen, what do you think about that? Yeah, this is a problem for many of our candidates. A couples match because. and matching program and I think you're, we do our best to contact from directors and other specialties at other institutions on that for our they've always been very receptive to take it takes a, it's a little bit more work logistically it takes some time but everyone's receptive to do it and I think that all program directors and medical student advisors want to be uh, we possibly can yeah, I would say don't hesitate at all. Um, you know, this on 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 the departments on the on the ophthalmology side, we will get these requests from our colleagues all the time, and we know that we're going to be making these requests to our colleagues. So everyone really does try to to help each other, and it's always helpful to to get that that we should. Um, get on this sooner rather than later because you know people do their 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 in, their invitation list et cetera et cetera so to get the name on on the on the on the radar sooner rather than later it is it is absolutely at anyone you know at all um, be uh, you know off put by by raising that question thank you and uh, we have a question here about uh, international medical graduates looking to match in ophthalmology, and the question is really what happens should they have non compete on the U.S. MLEs? Uh, should they reconsider this as a specialty? Is that a – does yes. that make it impossible for them to pursue ophthalmology? So um, I would say it's not impossible. It's totally possible. You just have to work harder. And, you know, I'm myself and a foreign graduate, as Mike said, you know, if you, for instance, did uh, other things like your PhD, so, you know, people would understand that perhaps the USMLE scores are not going to be as, as high as people who just presented the, who are, who are not, who are, who are a U.S. graduates. So, it's possible. I would not consider this as a, as a huge disadvantage. What I would say is that trade more in your research hard to get. Um, so that's that's what can I always have a backup plan. So you should have a. You know, you can always also look for vacancies. And um, that would be my piece of advice. Just just keep trying. Some people have, I, I know foreign graduates uh, uh, didn't match the second or third time. Thank you. There's someone here, uh, a similar sort of issue. This is a student who's wondering if your application is not quite as strong as you might hope, uh, and you're concerned about whether you'll match or not. How do you feel about that student dual applying into a less competitive specialty as well as into ophthalmology. Assuming that this is a U.S. Uh, US, medical, uh, US yeah, well. medical student, I would recommend to the medical student, if they don't feel strong, take a flex year, do research for their candidate. The, the thought of applying in ophthalmology, which is an early match, and then if you and applying in something else that's through the uh, 
the regular oh, match, see. would you recommend that approach? If the Castilian feels this, that is not completely, you know, some people are really in ophthalmology, but if you if you are open to other specialties, yes, have to go for the back. Thoughts on that, Mike uh, or Stephen? <laughs> Uh, so I, I would say that, that you know, um, ophthalmology is, you know, if somebody really wants to think out of the box um, in this area, you know, if you do, a, if somebody is, a, you know, an F, a, a G and, and really worried about it, things like that, if you do a, for example, you go ahead and you do that, um, that pathology um, residency or you do a neurology and, um, and then Ophthalmology. People will look. Given you know the 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 the, um, the 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 market demands in ophthalmology for really good um, neurology neuroophthalmologists, really good pathologists. You know you could make those areas. Um, you're going to get something that you can see yourself doing that, and and you want to retain, and you you know you're committed to a long pathway. Um, you know it it may actually be the the kind of thing that actually leads to both career and a very marketable skill set, um, but it's a long pathway. So uh, I agree with the idea, uh, you know, the concept of having a backup plan. And you know, you, with your advisors and mentors, you should talk about you know how, how the need to have a backup plan. But there are a lot of flavors of it. It may be well, I'm going to do a year of research, or I'm going to do I'm going to do two years of research. It may be I'm going to start my PhD or get a master's in something. It may be that I'm going to go ahead and do three years of medicine or pediatrics and get boarded in that and then reapply. And I think those are all very viable routes. And uh, so I, in that situation, I don't think it's a horrible idea to what I'm going to do and I'm going to work and do some ophthalmic research that's related etc. It's a value judgment. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sandra, there was a question to clarify number of applications per person that were submitted. So yes, in the year of the, uh, the, for this year uh, matching 2008, there were 70 applicants. So seven zero was the over. Compared to, for instance, in 2009, that the overage was 50. So there is an increment in the number of applications per applicant. We um, translate into the number. Possible. And, as a, and as I mentioned, the overage for people who got into residency were 12 interviews. More important than those actual credentials. If you are a very strong company, you need that, uh, that uh, a big number, but perhaps of applications and, and not even that number of interviews. we have and, and my own personal experience, if, if you are a strong candidate uh, in the, you know, 35 to 45 range is probably quite adequate. Right. And if you're a candidate, it may be in the 50 to 70 range. But I think there's a huge chunk of people that certainly don't need to apply to 70 or 80 or 90 programs. Sandra brought up is so critical. Uh, you're at you as a medical student are not are more competitive than others, but your mentors can help guide you. It doesn't applying to more is not the important ones. You want to apply to the ones that are best fit for what you're looking for and your qualifications. Uh, there's a really good feature of ophthalmology with respect to and technology, patient population, pros, cons for medical students. Uh, this would be a great question for all of the three of you to sort of comment on in terms of how you see the future of ophthalmology. Maybe we'll start with you, Stephen. So I think, you know, there are a number of, um, of, uh, of studies that have 
demographics of the workforce and so on. A, um, a, a lot of the, um, really the interesting stuff has actually come from uh, Shazad's program. You know, Paul Lee has done some really nice work on this. I think the bottom line is that, you know, if you there's actually going to be a workforce shortage in, in ophthalmology going forward. How, um, how uh, you know, basically healthcare delivery uh, affects, you know, um, the care delivery systems of the problem, but you know um, uh, the pathology isn't going anywhere, and the isn't going anywhere. So there, there actually is, um, you know, if you're going to pick a field that that actually does have a, a pretty good runway in front of it, it actually would be ophthalmology. And this takes into account, you know, the um, the the concerns metric scope of practice and so on. Um, the truth of the matter is, we we actually um, do need to figure out a way of with optometry because even working into the the, the mix optometric workforce, there's really still a lot of care that has to be delivered. I would agree with Steve, and I think the future is very bright. The population is aging, the pathology is increasing, and the number of ophthalmologists is not nearly increasing at the same rate. Uh, and whatever the system is going to look like, how we integrate with optometry and other professionals like you know nurse practitioners or physician assistants or orthoptists, things like that, need to be able to design the systems and make sure that they are operating at a high quality and efficient uh, cost-effective level. So I think it's really always going to be needed earlier, certain specialties like neuro-ophthalmology. I mean, right now they're – so uh, I don't think you have to – There's a specific question about um, letters of recommendation. Uh, if you don't have a home ophthalmologist, uh, is it okay to get letters from community ophthalmologists, or is it better to go to other programs, rotations to get letters from academic programs? So uh, I can answer that one. So um, you know, a, I think you can get with a local ophthalmologist at your home, or even again, you can just go to your mentors. And doesn't have to be an ophthalmology. Maybe you just can get only one ophthalmology, and people would understand. Uh, you know that perhaps your your school doesn't have ophthalmology. But the most important is that those letters have to be strong letters that really people who advocate for you, who knows you very well, more than they actually, you know, that it has to specifically be two letters from ophthalmology. I, I think more important is the quality and comes from. We have time for probably one or two more questions. Uh, we have someone whose husband is a postdoc in applied physics and biochemistry who Position this year, how would you give them advice on this particular situation and with uh, programs? Mike? Uh, so, the, the hus so the husband is already completely in training, is looking for a, not a postdoc, but a Is looking for position. a faculty position, yeah. Okay. Well, um, I think I would start by. Uh, just you know, getting online and seeing what opportunities are available at the institutions that you know the, the candidate is interested in, or or in the region, to make my contacts at that point. I think that um, that the program, the ophthalmology program, maybe after that person is selected for an interview, then that'd be something to communicate. A dialogue could be uh, started maybe at that point. And then, of course, if there is a match, then you know typically the the program would you know go out and and try to be as helpful as possible at their institution as well as others in the area. It'd be probably premature to start that dialogue prior to you know further down the um, application and interview process. Okay. Just do individual contacting. So we're really out of time at this point, so I just wanted to thank all of our participants, our uh, speakers, Dr. McLeod, Dr. Sitakowski.
Suma for wonderful talks and for wonderful questions and answers. Dr. Meehan, my colleague who has been moderating with me, and to the Academy for allowing us to do this. And who have tuned in and asked one an interesting and stressful journey that you're sort of under. This um, presentation, along with the other two webinars, will be on the medical student of the Academy website, the American Academy of Ophthalmology. When we sign off tonight, it will go immediately to the American Academy bookmark it, then you can come back. So to our why it's interesting to be an ophthalmology presentation. A whole variety of other interesting things that will be helpful. There's, there are things on the website that will help you with thinking about the residency, how to pick a residency. There are things there that are interactive cases you can fool with. So there's a lot that you uh, So it's a little bit as well. So bookmark it, come back. Hopefully we'll be doing things like this in the future. So thank you. Uh, have a good rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Good night. Bye-bye.